But the second relationship is the one, Leviticus 19, that the two may be talking about, about the, 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 the younger people having mentors. Let me just read Leviticus 19, that the two. Stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. In other words, you must look at older people as your mentors. So you may have a mentee yourself, but you have a mentor. Do you have the order? Do you have do you respect age or you feel like there's nothing I need to know? If that's your opinion, you will not be the first. That's what happened to the son of Solomon, and he lost the kingdom. He did not, he was given advice by older people and he ignored it and decided his age mates are the ones that would help him. And <clears throat> in the process, he lost his kingdom. How many of us do not have any respect for the aged? Don't seek help from them. Do not even want to hear anything from them. So, they can't stand up in the presence of the aged. And it's not just standing up physically. It is actually showing respect. And that's what the, the verse goes on. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. So the best way of showing respect to an old person is to seek his advice, is to listen to his advice, is to tell him that what he told you last time the way you have implemented it and how it has helped you, it will make his day to hear that his life, even in old age, is having an impact. So, here the word of God is saying, stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly. Please, please understand the word of God is not so in YouTube. It's not telling you to obey them. He's telling you to respect them. There's a whole difference between respecting and obeying. Children obey their parents, but adults respect their parents. They don't necessarily obey them. Why? Because by the time you are 50 and your mother is 80, there's a likelihood that your mother may not know a lot of things that are happening currently. She may have be having a disease and you have a doctor friend who is who can help her. If she insists that she is the one who knows, she will be in a lot of trouble. Or if she gives you advice uh, that is based on her history and there have been new discoveries, there will be trouble. That's why it's really unwise for an adult to obey his parents in every case. The word, the Bible doesn't require an adult to obey his parents or to obey the elderly. It's asking them to respect. That, of course, is again is African customs. African customs, you are not allowed, allowed to disobey your parents. You must obey them. But the Bible doesn't require you. The Bible requires that you respect them. You can respect somebody because even when you don't do what he has asked you to do, you will tell him very respectively, with a lot of respect, that because of some this and this and that which I've considered, I will not be able to do it the way you said it. And a wise person who understands you are you're an adult, you can make your own decision. So, what the mentor requires of the mentee is not obedience. What the mentor requires of the mentee is a key consideration because a mentor is an advisor, not an instructor. A mentor is a friend, not a boss. So when the mentor tells you something, three things. First of all, he knows he's not the only one because you are not encouraged to have only one mentor. You check with this one, you check with the other one. Finally, the decision is yours. And because the mentor knows that you are, he's not the only one you are consulting, at least he knows what you, he tells you, you will consider. Because you respect him, you will consider it. 
But even if you don't do what he tells you, your friendship will still remain. Because he was clear in his mind, he was not instructing you, he was advising you. You tell him, oh, by the way, I thought about this, I looked at this, I didn't do it that way. Ah, that's okay, that's okay. If somebody is insisting or that you must do it the way he told you, please drop him as your mentor. Till you continue to respect him, but it's dangerous because your relationship will break. Because that's not the relationship between an adult and another adult. Nobody becomes the, the instructor of the other, if they are really friends. So you need to avoid a relationship where somebody expects you to obey whatever he says, he doesn't expect you to consider it, wants you to implement it without consulting beyond him or her. That will be quite a problem. So here the word of God is telling us to show, to stand in the presence of the age, to show respect to them. But that does not include doing everything they tell you. The other thing that um, I understand about mentoring, I've told you there are three relationships. We have talked about two. One is a mentor who is better than you. You are related to somebody better than you. A mentee, you are related to somebody not as good as you. You are helping them. But then the third relationship, which is very important, is one with somebody of your level, a colleague. And that's a very important person to have. Because you see, with a mentee, if you have a problem, you don't feel like telling him because you might crush him. He waits on you. He thinks, he thinks of you as a solution. So if you burden him with your complex, difficult situations, it will not be fair. So you need somebody beyond a mentee. With a mentor, sometimes you feel like what you're asking is so small, the mentor might think you are not clever. So somehow there are some things you would feel like not disturbing your mentor on. That's why you need this, that relationship with somebody you can call um, peer, peer mentoring. Peer mentoring means you are equals but you are peers, but you still are mentor to one another. And it's much easier because what he is, you are struggling with, he was struggling with last week. What he is struggling with currently, you struggled with two weeks ago. So you're able to help one another. This that relationship is very important. People who are just like you, you don't fear them. If you hear so-and-so is coming to visit you, you don't start checking whether you have a shot. He can find you exactly the way you are. You don't start trying to behave better or whatever. You, you just continue the way you are because he is a colleague. That person can help you because he can see you naked. He can see you the way you are. And that way be able to help you. The verse we have been looking at in Leviticus 19.32 about relating with the elderly actually says, Stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect to the elderly and revere your God, I am the Lord. In other words, the reason why you need to relate well with older people is not just because they are your mentors. It's not just because you are going to benefit out of that relationship, which all the, whole, the whole issue about mentoring is. And it's not just because God you can use the aged to talk to you. So that is God talking, but talking through the aged. And he also re mentioned that even the aged also need to learn that they are, cannot replace God, that they are not God. And therefore, when they talk to you, they give you advice, not instruction. But I want to note the, the, head, the, head, verse, the head of the verse. It says, revere God. I am the Lord. In other words, when you have these good relationships with the people, it brings glory to God. It's a reverence to God. The reason why you are treating the elderly well is not because they deserve it. Some don't. It's not because they are very wise. Some are not. But you are doing so, and if you do so, God is saying you are, you are revering him. 
And why do you need to revere God? Because he is the Lord. He is the one who controls your life. He is the one who holds your destiny. And so if you want to please the Lord, he says one of the ways you can please him is by living well with the elderly. But he was already gone on and said, even you, you are older to somebody else. Relate well with them also. I have written a book titled Christianity and Culture in which I discuss the fact that almost every tribe or any group you go to, it will certainly be having a form of worship. Anthropologists have not discovered so far any tribe, however remote a place, that doesn't worship. What then that means is that every tribe traditionally has a, a religion of their own. You cannot go to a tribe that doesn't have. So when a missionary comes, he needs to be careful that what he will be replacing in that tribe is not their other customs. It's only the customs of the, that relate to belief and religion. One such custom, one such I custom in many, is the one for determining what the future holds, trying to explain what is happening, complex things, and how you do that. And so when you have a custom to try to help you to determine the future by seeking wisdom other than from yourself, you are now entering into a religious activity. And I argue in my book that the only direction the Bible allows us to go is prayer. Talk to God. Then the Spirit of God will give you the information you need to live your life. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 26 and 31, we read, Do not eat any meat with the blood still in it. Do not practice divination or seek omens. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists. For you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord, you are God. In order to know which traditional customs are religion and therefore must be replaced by faith in Jesus Christ, this, this, this portion gives us a bit of the list. And the first one is saying anything that has to do with blood. Obviously, I am taking from this verse the reference in Acts chapter 15 when the, 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 the apostles met to determine do the Gentiles have to stop their customs, their traditions? And they said no. The Gentiles don't have to stop their customs and copy the missionary's custom. No, the missionary should not come from his culture to come and impose his culture on another group. However, things that have to do with religion, the Gentiles must leave and start only following the biblical requirements for such. And one of them is that any custom that has to do with blood must be stopped. Why is any custom with the blood supposed to be stopped? Just like the, the Jews were told, the book of Acts also tells us as Christians, because uh, for whatever reason, and I believe it is Jehovah who put this in every tribe because he's the creator of everybody, the blood is used 
as an instrument of appeasement of the divine. So most tribes will shed blood in order to appease the spirits, their God, whoever they believe is their God. Therefore, the moment you become a Christian, you now understand that true, yes, blood is required for appeasing your God, but Jesus died on the cross, and with his death, he appeased the God the Father. We now no longer need to shed the blood of chicken or goats or oxen, no longer, because Jesus shed righteous blood once and for all. Now, when you have trouble, when there is a problem between us and God, all we need is to plead the blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. And he promises us in the New Testament, he will forgive us every sin. Isn't that the message of first letter of John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9? Yeah, agree you have sinned. But please remember, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse you from sin, forgive your sin, and that includes every type of sin. So when you become a Christian, you no longer get involved in anything that to do with the shedding of blood. It therefore means every cultural custom that requires you kill a goat, stop it. And you know, for most of the uh, Africans, those customs have to do with when the child is born, they have to do with rites of passage when a, a boy is being circumcised, they have to do with weddings, the marriage is not confirmed until some blood is shed, it has to do with the death, after, if you don't want to be disturbed by the spirits of the dead, you, after the, they have, in their funeral, you include shedding blood. If you really are going to be to be obedient to the scriptures, you must avoid. I normally advise people, since eating is not where the problem is, is shedding blood, don't kill a goat with those trans ceremonies where your relatives know they are required by the traditional worship. Now, simply buy the meat in the butchery. Don't kill in your home. Because even if you, your conscience is clear, you are just killing for meat. The people around you may not believe you. They believe you are also doing what they do. The best thing is, buy the meat in the butchery. When there is any ceremony that would ordinarily require shedding of blood. Because now, what you do is you just pray. Just seek the intervention of God. And it will be okay. You see, most of us are, are, ancestor, are involved in ancestral worship. And in ancestral worship, most of this shedding of blood is a spirit, is kind of um, seeking to appease the spirits of the dead. But if you have become a Christian, you no longer need to do that. So you don't shed blood. But the other thing that is listed in, the, in Leviticus 19 is do not practice divination or seek omens. Again, in ancestral worship, which many animists all over the world are involved in, it will be difficult not to be involved in divination. Why? Remember, there is a belief that anything wrong happening in your family is because the ancestors are not happy. So how will you know exactly what the ancestors need? How will you know what is causing trouble? Most people believe when there is a problem in your, in your life, either your children are not passing exams, or you, you are not getting a job, or you are not getting rich, or several people are getting sick, and some are so sick, even the hospital has no answer, they do not know what the problem. You then feel like you need to find out how. That's why you cannot have ancestral worship without diviners. Mundomogo. Every tribe has a guy, some which some some kind of a doctor, and is not regarded as a bad doctor. You know, 
he is the kind of person who will help to discern exactly what can get you better when you are sick. But it, does, it is not done scientifically. He has a connection with the Spirit. And the Bible is saying, diviners, people who determine for you the future, who determine for you the, 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 the things that are, the mysterious things that are happening, you don't have to just believe. Find out. The word of God saying that those are the customs that must be stopped by anybody who is a worshiper of Jehovah. Leave the unknown things to God. Just live your life. Difficult thing to do. And um, the question is, will you trust in God and God alone? 